And our final story tonight, an exceptionally rare glimpse into ancient history. A shard from a clay vessel that may have belonged to the famous Gideon of the biblical book of Judges. The New Testament Gospels continually emphasize Jesus' importance. He is depicted as the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of Israel, the Messiah. Each title reflects his extraordinary and multifaceted role. But recently, scholars have uncovered a manuscript long hidden from the world, the Book of Judas. This ancient text, hidden for centuries, reveals many startling revelations about Jesus' death and was also narrated by Judas Iscariot just before his tragic demise. Filled with mysterious passages, these texts challenge traditional beliefs about Jesus' life and teachings. Often referred to as the Gnosis, these writings provide a glimpse into secret wisdom and hidden truths. When we delve into these ancient texts, we encounter secret knowledge that invites us to question our understanding of Jesus and his mission on earth. What disturbing and heartbreaking wisdom is contained in these pages? And why have they not been able to solve it for so long? Join us in this video as we explore what Judas Iscariot revealed about Jesus' death before his untimely demise. Before we start the video, if you are new to our channel, subscribe to it and give us your feedback in the comments. Despite Jesus being revered as a virtuous figure, not everyone viewed him favorably. Some Jews, disturbed by his claims of divinity and his unconventional teachings, sought his demise. They accused him of blasphemy and feared that he was leading people astray, even as his miracles and teachings validated his divine message. Their resolve to see him executed was unshakable, and they demanded a cruel and painful crucifixion. To apprehend Jesus, they needed a way to identify him, as many had only heard of him, but had not seen his face. Enter Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' twelve disciples from Kerioth in Judea. Though he was part of Jesus' inner circle, Judas's origins made him an outsider among the predominantly Galilean disciples. After his death, it was revealed that Judas's surname linked him to a group of radicals, though he had no actual affiliation with them. Despite this, Jesus entrusted Judas with the management of their finances, a responsibility usually given to Matthew, the tax collector. This decision proved crucial, as it positioned Judas as a trusted confidant, making his subsequent betrayal all the more shocking. None of the other disciples suspected him of treachery, even though Jesus had subtly hinted at Judas's impending betrayal, fulfilling an ancient prophecy. In Gethsemane, as Jesus took his disciples to pray in anticipation of his impending capture, Judas arrived with a mob armed with swords and other weapons. Judas approached Jesus and greeted him with a kiss, a prearranged signal to identify him. The moment Judas kissed Jesus, the crowd moved in to arrest him. Peter, in a desperate act of defense, drew his sword and struck the ear of one of the high priest's slaves. Jesus quickly rebuked Peter, admonishing him with the words, He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. He then reminded his disciples that he could call upon his father to fight for him, but chose not to, so that scripture might be fulfilled. With a miraculous touch, Jesus healed the slave's ear before surrendering himself to the mob, while his disciples fled in fear. Because the elders and priests did not know Jesus' appearance, they relied on Judas to identify him. Judas agreed to this task in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, a significant sum for the betrayal of Jesus Christ. His actions were a pivotal moment leading up to the crucifixion, a betrayal foretold and fulfilled as part of the divine plan. Might as well make an acceptable sum from betraying Jesus, right? If Judas had merely informed the high priests and elders that he would identify Jesus without receiving any payment, his actions might have been viewed differently, more as a painful duty rather than a betrayal. Judas could have argued that he was acting out of disillusionment, given Jesus' cryptic hints about his forthcoming betrayal. This might have been seen as a reluctant act rather than an outright treachery. 
However, by negotiating a payment for his betrayal, Judas cemented his act as one of outright treason. The 30 pieces of silver he received were more than just a bribe. They were a symbol of his betrayal. According to John, Judas's greed was a significant factor in his decision. John reveals that Judas, who was entrusted with the group's finances, pilfered from the everyday purse, a fund used for Jesus' ministry and expenses. This fondness for money played a crucial role in his betrayal of Jesus Christ. The choice of 30 pieces of silver as the payment for Judas' betrayal is rich with symbolic meaning. Scholars suggest that this amount was not arbitrary, but held deep significance. First, it symbolizes the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies that Jesus himself had referenced. If Judas had refused the sum, the narrative of Jesus' capture, crucifixion, and subsequent resurrection might have unfolded differently. Secondly, 30 pieces of silver reflected the low value that the high priests and elders placed on Jesus. Despite being hailed as a king and the son of God by many, the high priests and elders regarded Jesus as a blasphemer, not worthy of respect. To them, he was a criminal deserving of a humiliating death, crucifixion, the method used by the Romans to punish and make an example of criminals. In fact, 30 pieces of silver was merely enough to purchase a slave, according to the Hebrew Torah, far from the worth of an entire year's wages. This trivial sum raises questions about the true nature of Judas's motivation. Although money was a factor, it wasn't the sole reason behind Judas's betrayal. The events leading up to his actions were complex and deeply intertwined with his relationship with Jesus. A critical moment occurred during the Last Supper, a significant event in Christianity symbolizing divine presence and joy. This meal took place in an upper room in Jerusalem on the eve of Passover, a date of profound significance both in Jewish and Christian traditions. During the Last Supper, Jesus revealed to his disciples that one among them would betray him. When questioned, Jesus indicated that the traitor would be the one to whom he gave bread after dipping it in a dish. Jesus then handed this bread to Judas. According to Luke, it was after receiving this bread that Satan entered Judas, influencing him to betray Jesus. This moment marked a turning point. Judas left the supper to negotiate Jesus' capture with the high priests. Judas's actions during the Last Supper and the subsequent possession by Satan raise intriguing questions about his role among the disciples. Despite being entrusted with Jesus' finances, there seems to have been an underlying distrust towards him. The Synoptic Gospels frequently mention Judas last when listing the disciples, hinting at his contentious position within the group. But why did the high priests want to kill Jesus? The Jewish leaders accused Jesus of violating their religious statutes, particularly for healing on the Sabbath, an act they deemed unlawful. The Pharisees and legal experts constantly watched Jesus, eager to catch him in transgression. Their scrutiny was heightened whenever he performed miracles on the Sabbath, hoping to entrap him in a confession of wrongdoing. In this context, Jesus' teachings and actions became a battleground for religious authority and interpretation, leading to his arrest and crucifixion. The motives behind Judas's betrayal and the high priest's relentless pursuit of Jesus reveal a complex tapestry of personal, spiritual, and political factors that shaped the events of that fateful time. The appropriateness of healing on the Sabbath becomes even more intriguing against the backdrop of significant discord among Jewish religious authorities regarding specific observances. Matthew's portrayal of Jesus stands out for its captivating accessibility. Jesus, rather than speaking plainly, paints vivid scenes that resonate deeply. For example, he describes a scenario where a sheep falls into a pit on the Sabbath, prompting his audience to reflect on whether they would extend aid to the distressed animal. Jesus isn't merely addressing the sheep. He emphasizes the importance of compassion 
over rigid adherence to rules. He urges people to prioritize kindness, even if it means overlooking certain religious decrees. To underline this message, Jesus performs a remarkable act of healing. He restores a man's withered hand, imbuing it with strength and vigor once more. Yet, instead of a claim, his actions provoke resentment, particularly among the Pharisees. They disapprove of Jesus' challenges to their authority and actions that defy their strict understanding of the Sabbath. Their hostility escalates as the Pharisees ally with the Herodians, supporters of King Herod, to plot against Jesus. This surprising coalition aims to undermine him. Among numerous Sabbath healing accounts, one stands out. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus heals on the Sabbath in a private residence, diverging from the usual public venue like a synagogue. Despite being aware of the Pharisees' strict Sabbath regulations, why did Jesus choose to heal on this day? When Jesus performed healings on the Sabbath, he did so not to break the law, but to fulfill it. As stated in Matthew 5 and John 17, 1, Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus' healing on the Sabbath was an expression of compassion for those in great distress. Moreover, it was a challenge to the Pharisees' superficial piety, exposing their selfish desire for power and their disregard for God's mercy and compassion. He purposefully told stories to illustrate that love and kindness should take precedence over rigid adherence to man-made rules. Three notable instances highlight how Jesus' healings on the Sabbath drew attention and sparked debate. He pointed out the Pharisees' hypocrisy, noting that they would not hesitate to care for their animals on the Sabbath while neglecting human needs. Jesus illustrated this paradox by questioning whether they would hesitate to untie their ox or donkey and lead it to water on the Sabbath, as described in Luke 13. Through these actions, Jesus challenged the religious leaders' interpretation of Sabbath laws, posing a crucial question. Is it lawful to do good or harm, to save life, or destroy it on the Sabbath? Jesus' healings on the Sabbath clearly demonstrate that prioritizing kindness and preserving life surpasses rigid adherence to regulations. Conversely, using Sabbath rules as a pretext for harm or cruelty was depicted as a distortion of divine law. Jesus frequently performed these healings to highlight that the Sabbath was meant to honor God and to benefit people's well-being. As Mark notes, the Sabbath was created for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. It allowed individuals to pause, reflect, and focus on their spiritual connection with God amidst their daily tasks. When Jesus continued to heal on the Sabbath, it reflected God's purpose behind this special day. The story illustrates that our stubbornness might sometimes be fruitless, as the importance lies not in the obstacle, but in the goal we seek to achieve. It emphasizes the responsibility of every individual to ensure their belief system aligns with biblical principles. Now, if you thought the Jewish leader's actions were surprising, brace yourself, because we're about to reveal something even more astonishing. Judas's betrayal of Jesus was actually fulfilling a prophecy. The term betrayal implies a pre-existing trust, a person can only be said to betray someone if there was trust to begin with. Since Jesus himself used the word betrayal, it indicates that Judas was someone Jesus loved and trusted deeply. This love and trust may explain Jesus' profound emotional turmoil at Gethsemane. Despite knowing Judas would betray him, Jesus faced immense anguish, crying and praying for the event to pass him by. His emotional pain was palpable as the hour of his capture approached. In parallel, Judas, grappling with his own doubts and turmoil, made the fateful decision to betray Jesus. Significantly, it was after the Last Supper that Judas approached the high priests, suggesting he shared in some of Jesus' emotional struggles. Judas' choice to identify Jesus with a kiss, a symbol of hospitality and welcome, 
further underscores the complexity of his betrayal. A kiss, traditionally a gesture of love and appreciation, became the signal for Jesus' arrest. This act of betrayal, framed in such intimate terms, reveals the depth of Judas's internal conflict and the profound impact of his actions on the unfolding narrative of Jesus' life and mission. Whether formally or informally, a kiss is traditionally a gesture of love and hospitality. Given that Judas' act was one of betrayal, which could be seen as stemming from animosity, it's striking that he chose to identify Jesus with an act so inherently opposite to his intentions. The kiss Judas planted on Jesus' cheek at Gethsemane would go down in history as the kiss of death, a term used by theologians to underscore its significance. One profound reason Judas opted for this method was to signify his perceived closeness to Jesus. It was a complex gesture reflecting the deep bond between them and how Jesus related to all his disciples. Judas likely believed that merely pointing out Jesus would have been a degrading act, particularly since he had accepted a meager 30 pieces of silver for his betrayal. The kiss, in contrast, added layers of meaning to Judas's motives, complicating our understanding of his actions. More poignantly, after Jesus' capture, Judas's remorse became evident. Realizing the gravity of his betrayal, he was overwhelmed with guilt and self-loathing. He attempted to return the 30 pieces of silver to the high priests who refused to take it back, stating that it had become his money. Feeling trapped and unredeemable, Judas concluded that his grave betrayal warranted death, leading him to hang himself on what would later be known as the Tree of Judas. Paul's account of Judas's death is even more harrowing, describing how Judas fell from a height, suffering a gruesome fate that involved bashing his head and disfiguring his eyes. This depiction underscores the depth of Judas's remorse, but also highlights that he may not have fully grasped Jesus's teachings. Had he understood the essence of Jesus's message, one of forgiveness, love, and redemption, he might have sought repentance rather than choosing to end his life. Jesus preached the boundless love of the Father, performing miracles to exemplify this divine compassion. For instance, he prevented a crowd from stoning an adulterous woman, emphasizing that everyone is flawed. He healed sinners to demonstrate God's love and grace. Jesus' ministry was built upon this message of unconditional love. Judas' suicide suggests that grief alone could not have driven his betrayal. Instead, it implies that Judas was fulfilling a prophecy. It seems as if he was compelled by forces beyond his comprehension, carrying out a necessary part of the divine plan. Jesus' earthly mission required his death and resurrection, pivotal elements for the completion of his ministry and the demonstration of God's enduring love despite human failings. Thus, the role of a betrayer was crucial, and Judas was cast in this role according to prophecy. The prophecy of the coming of the Son of God was foretold in the Old Testament, and Jesus himself was aware of his impending death and the identity of his betrayer. He even foretold to his disciples that one among them would betray him, later identifying the very person who would fulfill this prophecy. This raises a significant theological question. Was Judas's betrayal an act of free will or predestined fulfillment of prophecy? The necessity of Judas's actions for the prophecy's fulfillment invites a deeper exploration into the nature of free will versus predestination. If Judas's betrayal was essential for the completion of Jesus' mission, it challenges our understanding of free will in the grand scheme of divine purpose. It is indeed challenging to assign blame solely to Judas for betraying Jesus, given the complexity of divine will and predestination. The path of Judas's life, along with the entire narrative of Jesus' crucifixion, had been predetermined. This raises a profound question about the nature of free will versus predestination. 
If Judas's actions were part of a divine plan, to what extent could they be attributed to his own free will? Theological discussions often grapple with this tension. One argument posited by theologians is that Judas, from the beginning, allowed himself to be used as an instrument in this divine plan. The Synoptic Gospels paint a portrait of Judas as a man with questionable morals. He pilfered from the common purse and even succumbed to the influence of evil. This portrayal suggests that while Jesus was destined to die for humanity's sake, Judas's role was not explicitly foretold in prophecy. Instead, Judas's susceptibility to corruption and malevolent influence made him a vessel for fulfilling the necessary part of the prophecy. Conversely, some argue that Judas's actions were inevitable, regardless of his personal flaws. His existence and subsequent betrayal were integral to the narrative of Jesus' sacrifice, and his name has come to symbolize betrayal itself. This perception is deeply ingrained in modern culture, where Judas is synonymous with treachery. For instance, the film Judas and the Black Messiah draws a parallel to biblical events, illustrating how a trusted ally's betrayal can shift the course of history for personal gain and broader societal change. Yet, contemporary scholarly works offer fresh perspectives on Judas's role. Recent interpretations, especially following the discovery of the Gnostic Gospel of Judas, explore Judas's perspective and suggest that his betrayal was a necessary component of the divine plan. This view posits that Judas was an essential player in the fulfillment of the prophecy, rather than merely a villain. The betrayal, seen through this lens, becomes a crucial element of the grand narrative of Jesus' mission. Jesus' death and resurrection, central to Christian belief, are seen as pivotal in restoring humanity's relationship with God. The crucifixion is interpreted as a profound act of sacrificial love, leading to the restoration of divine grace and the promise of eternal life. Theological significance is derived from the belief that through Jesus' suffering and subsequent resurrection, believers are reunited with God, experiencing renewed joy, spiritual power, and eternal hope. The accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection offer rich material for Christological analysis, spanning from the canonical Gospels to Pauline epistles. In Johannine Christology, Jesus' submission to crucifixion is viewed as a sacrificial act, undertaken as an agent or servant of God, ultimately leading to victory. This understanding builds upon the salvific theme found in the Gospel of John, particularly highlighted in John 1.29, where John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Proclamation of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Jesus is hailed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, a profound declaration that resonates throughout Christian theology. This essential aspect of Christology is further explored in the Acts of the Apostles, where it is affirmed that Jesus' crucifixion was not a mere accident of fate, but a deliberate event foreknown and meticulously orchestrated by God. Acts 2.23 underscores that Jesus' death, even at the hands of sinful individuals, was an integral part of God's predetermined plan. The death and resurrection of Jesus are foundational to various theological interpretations of how salvation is granted to humanity. For instance, the substitutionary atonement theory posits that Jesus' death was a sacrificial act of perfect obedience and divine love, which ultimately pleased God. This view highlights Jesus' willing sacrifice as a cornerstone of salvation. In contrast, the moral influence theory emphasizes the profound moral teachings of Jesus, viewing his death more as an act of martyrdom that exemplifies his commitment to justice and righteousness. Since the Middle Ages, these two views have sparked considerable debate within Western Christianity. Evangelical Protestants, particularly those adhering to penal substitution theory, 
typically support the substitutionary view. In contrast, liberal Protestants often reject this notion in favor of the moral influence theory. Within the Roman Catholic tradition, both perspectives have found a place. The satisfaction doctrine is integrated into the concept of penance, where Catholics are called to perform acts of reparation for the sufferings of Christ. Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical Misericordia Dei, defined these acts as efforts to stand beside the countless crosses on which the Son of God is continually crucified. This doctrine underscores the duty of Catholics to engage in acts of penance and compensation for Jesus' suffering. On the other hand, Eastern Orthodox Christians commonly adhere to the Christus Victor theory. This view asserts that God sent Jesus to conquer death and defeat Satan, emphasizing the victory over evil as a central theme of Christ's mission. What do you think about these theological perspectives? Share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more insightful content.